to conduct an offensive on the area of Oral, Bryansk, which was a necessary springboard for the offensive to Moscow, the composition of the 2nd Panzer Group was changed as follows. The 46th Tank Corps together with the SS Division Reich and the Regiment Great Germany was transferred to the subordination of the 4th Tank Group, operating in the direction of Roslavl. The 1st Cavalry Division was again subordinated to the 2nd Tank Group. In addition, in the subordination of the 2nd Panzer Group were transferred 48th Panzer Corps under command of General Kempfeff in the 9th Panzer Division, 16th and 25th Motorized Division's 34th Corps, under command of General Metz in the 45th and 134th Infantry Divisions, 35th Corps under command of General Kempfey in the 293rd, 262nd, 296th and 95th Infantry Divisions. I decided to strike the main blow through Glukov to Oral with the forces of the 24th Panzer Corps. To the right of the 24th Tank Corps Corps was to advance through Putival 48th Tank Corps to the left of the 24th Tank Corps, County 4th Tank Corps, came from the area Shuska 47th Tank Corps. Provision of the right flank was entrusted to the 34th Corps, the left flank to the 35th Corps and the 1st Cavalry Division which were to move in steps behind the tank corps. The 48th Tank Corps was assigned the task to pass through Nedrigailov and Sumy, and having destroyed the enemy operating there, to concentrate in Putival to prepare for the offensive. With this I wanted to secure my right flank from the very beginning. However, having put forward this bold idea, I underestimated the strength of the resistance of the Russian troops operating behind Kiev, the 48th Panzer Corps was, was unable, as will be said further on, to repulse the enemy. It was forced to withdraw from the battle and head for the area of its concentration, moving behind the front line occupied by the Great Germany Regiment. The 25th Motorized Division withdrew from the battle with great difficulty, losing some of its vehicles. It would have been better if I had taken Liebenstein's advice and moved the 48th Tank Corps behind the front line from the start. Of course, this required that the infantry of the 34th Corps arrived somewhat earlier. However, to reckon with this had to only five days later. To complete our tank divisions, we were eventually promised 100 new tanks. Unfortunately, 50 of them were mistakenly sent to Orsha and arrived to us too late. Fuel was also not delivered in the required quantity. The largest forces for the implementation of the entire upcoming operation were concentrated in the area of Roslavl. By the beginning of the offensive behind the front line were concentrated 1st Panzer Division, SS Division Reich, 3rd Motorized Division and Infantry Regiment Great Germany. In addition, there were also the 2nd and 5th Panzer Divisions, which were still in reserve. It is doubtful that such a massive concentration of tank forces for a frontal offensive was the right thing to do. In my opinion, it would have been more appropriate to leave the 46th Tank Corps in the 2nd Tank Group. It would also have been more advantageous to use the well-rested armoured divisions to make a flank attack rather than to conduct a frontal offensive. On September 27th, I visited the 48th Tank Corps in order to familiarize myself with its condition. After a brief talk at the Corps headquarters, located in Romney, I went to the village of Krasnaya, where there was the 9th Armored Division under the command of General Hubiki, and from there returned to Nedrigailov. On September 28th and 29th, it became clear that the attempt of the 48th Panzer Corps to advance directly on Putival failed. Therefore, our offensive in this area was stopped. Some success was, however, achieved in the area of Stepovka only by the fact that the enemy was misled and remained in ignorance of the actual direction of our strike. The 48th Tank Corps was moved to the north under the cover of the Regiment Great Germany, which at that time still remained in its former positions. On September 30th, the position of the units of the 2nd Tank Group was as follows. The 48th Panzer Corps moved out of the area of Gardiak, Stepovka and headed through Nedrigailov to Putival. With the 9th Panzer Division in front, it was followed by the 25th and 16th Motorized Divisions, which had just been replaced by infantry formations of the 34th Corps. 
The 24th Armoured Corp marched from Glukov to Sevieski. Oral, with the 3rd and 4th Armoured Divisions in front, followed by the 10th Motorized Division. The 47th Tank Corps came out of Yampol, advancing its right flank in the direction of Sevieski. The 29th Motorized Division was to follow a ledge to the left in the direction towards Seredina Buda. Both corps, which were assigned the task of securing the flanks, moved out, moving part of their forces through Kostoboba, part through Romney. The 1st Cavalry Division was located on the western bank of the Sudost River in the area north and south of Poga. Our offensive was unexpected for the enemy. The 24th Tank Corps advanced especially fast, reaching the point of Hainal. The 47th Tank Corps occupied the settlement Jurovka and advanced further to the northeast. On the morning of September 30th I went to Glukov, where we organized our new command post. From there I instructed General Kempev to allocate the necessary forces to secure the eastern flank of the 24th Panzer Corps in the Peterville area. Kempev, for his part, reported to me that in the vicinity of Shtepovka the Russians had suddenly attacked two battalions of the 119th Infantry Regiment and captured their motor transport. The Russians attacked with their heavy tanks. This was a very unpleasant loss. Some units of the 9th Panzer Division had to be turned back once more in order to restore the situation. General von Geyer reported that dive bombers could not take to the air because of bad weather. He assumed that in front of him are rear guards of the enemy, while General Lemelson reported that the offensive was a complete surprise. Army Group Command was informed that the removal from the front of the regiment Greater Germany is delayed because the Kempfev Corps is attacked by large enemy forces, and the replacement of the advanced units of his Corps Infantry 34th Corps delayed and will not begin until the night of October 1st. It will be another quarter of a day before the main body of infantry approaches. The population of Glukov asked us to allow them to use their church again. We willingly gave them permission to do so. On October 1st, the 24th Tank Corps Porps took Seve's car. Our troops managed to break through the enemy front. As fuel was obtained, the troops continued to advance vigorously. I left Glukov and headed through Esmond to Sevesk, to the 4th Tank Division. Along the road were various Russian vehicles that had been hit, which testified to the complete surprise of our offensive for the enemy. Close to the road, on a hill where stood a windmill, I saw Generals von Geyer and von Langerman. Many units of the 4th Panzer Division had already reached Sevesk. On the terrain remained traces of fierce fighting. On the road we saw dead Russians, met many wounded on the short way from the road to the mill. I and the officers accompanying me took 14 Russian prisoners hiding in the grass, including one officer who was still in telephone contact with Sevesk. Four kilometers north of Sevesk, which was already in our hands, I met Colonel Eberbach, the brave commander of a tank brigade of the 4th Armored Division. When I asked him whether he was able to continue the offensive to Dmitrovsk, he answered in the affirmative. Therefore, I ordered him to continue to pursue the enemy, although before that the generals had erroneously informed me that due to lack of fuel they were forced to suspend the offensive. During my conversation with Eberbach, the Russian aviation bombed the road on which our troops were moving, as well as the town of Sevisk. I then went to the forward units of our tank units, and announced the gratitude of the personnel of the unit commanded by Major Jumdenfeld. On the way back I informed the corps commander of my order to continue the offensive. The advanced units of the 24th Tank Corps advanced 130 kilometers during that day. The advanced detachment of our neighbor on the right 6th Army entered this day in Gardiak. Other parts of the army advanced in the direction of Mergorod, aiming to close the gap formed between us and the 17th Army. On October 2nd, the offensive continued with all its force, the front was completely broken through, and the Russian 13th Army was pushed back to the northeast. I visited the 10th Motor Division and the 41st Infantry Regiment, which was a part of that division, commanded by Colonel Trout. During these days we had very few casualties. 
However, the total losses from the beginning of the offensive were expressed in considerable figures. The troops received a small replenishment, but the new soldiers had only a desire to fight they did not have the combat experience and hardiness that our old soldiers had. The 4th Armoured Division occupied Cromi, thus reaching the highway going to Oral. On the morning of October 2nd, the entire Army Group Centre went on the offensive good weather contributed to the success of the offensive. Our neighbour on the left, the 2nd Army, despite the stubborn resistance of the enemy, broke through his defensive positions on the line, which passed along the line of the rivers Sudost Desna. On October 3rd, the 4th Panzer Division captured Oral. This gave us the opportunity to get a good highway and seize an important railroad and highway junction, which was to be the base for our further actions. The capture of the city occurred for the enemy so unexpectedly that when our tanks entered Oral, streetcars were still running in the city. The evacuation of the industrial enterprises, which was usually carefully prepared by the Russians, could not be realised. Starting from factories and plants and all the way to the railroad station, Machine tools and crates of factory equipment and raw materials lay everywhere in the streets. The 47th Tank Corp was assigned the task of advancing in the direction of Bryansk. The 6th Army acting to our right was advancing its right flank to Kharkov and its left flank through Sumy to Belgorod. This was important to ensure our right flank the 4th Tank Group broke through the enemy's front and advanced in the direction of Mosolsk, past Demensk in order to encircle the enemy located west of Vyazma. The 3rd Tank Group captured a bridgehead in the area of the upper reaches of the Dniapa River, near the town of Kholm. On October 4th, the forward units of the 24th Tank Corp captured Moyne, located on the road to Tula. The 3rd and 18th Panzer Divisions were advancing on Karakuf. The 17th Panzer Division captured a bridgehead on the Narusa River, ensuring the possibility of further advance to the north. Our neighbour to the left crossed the Bolva River and reached the railway line Sukhiniti Yelnia. The 3rd Tank Group occupied the town of Bili. The rear ears of Army Group Centre saw the first partisan action. Since I wanted to visit the 47th Tank Corps the next day, I sent my vehicles in advance to Dmitrovske where they were to wait for me at the landing site, where I was to arrive by Storch. This gave me an opportunity to avoid a long trip on the spoiled road. By ten o'clock. Thirty min. October 5th, I was already at General Lemelson's. The 18th Panzer Division had crossed the Oral Bryansk Road and was advancing in a northward direction. The 17th Panzer Division had been assigned the task of raiding and capturing Bryansk. I then flew on the Storch to the headquarters of the 24th Panzer Corps, located in Dmitrovsky. General von Geyer complained about the poor situation with fuel, on the regular provision of which largely depended on the success of further advance. Trophy fuel we unfortunately had very little. But since the airfield in Oral was in our hands, I made a compelling request to the commander of the 2nd Air Fleet to ensure the delivery by air of the fuel we needed in the amount of 500,000 litres. On this day I got a pretty impressive idea of the activity of the Russian Air Force. Immediately after I landed at the airfield, there was a raid by Russian aviation on the airfield in the 17th century, where there were up to 20 German fighters. Then the enemy aviation bombed the Corp headquarters, as a result of which window panes flew out in the room where we were. I then proceeded to the road along which the 3rd Panzer Division was advancing. Here we were also subjected to repeated bombing by Russian bombers, which flew in groups of three to six aircraft at high altitude, and therefore caused little damage. On October 6th, the air fleet promised us increased cover by fighters, and therefore we could count on an improvement in the situation. From that day our 2nd Tank Group became known as the 2nd Tank Army. The 25th Motorized Division was subordinated directly to the Army and transferred to Seviesk. The 48th Tank Corp occupied Rilsk, the 24th Corp extended its bridgehead on the Zusha River north of Oral, and the 47th Corps occupied Karakafov. 
Our neighbor on the right supposed to reach the line of our combat guard on the PCL River by October 6th. On our left, 43rd and 13th Army Corps were advancing on Sukunichi. German troops captured the town of Yuknov. On October 6th, our command post was moved to Sevi SK. South of Mtensk, the 4th Panzer Division was attacked by Russian tanks and had to endure a difficult moment. For the first time, the superiority of Russian T-34 tanks was shown in a sharp form. The division suffered significant losses. The planned rapid offensive on Tula had to be postponed for the time being. We were very happy to hear about the occupation of Bryansk by the 17th Panzer Division and the capture of the bridge across the Desna River, which provided us with the opportunity to establish communication with the 2nd Army, operating west of the Desna River. The state of our supply largely depended on the restoration of the highway and railroad or Bryansk. The encirclement of the enemy troops in the area between the Desna and Sudust rivers was carried out with great success. North of Borshchev, our troops captured a bridgehead on the Navlia River. No less joy brought us reports that on our open flank, where Kempfev's corps was slowly pulling up along the sinking road to Dmitriev, and the 34th Corps of General Metz was approaching Rilsk, it was quiet. The 1st Panzer Army, which was part of Army Group South, was assigned the task of advancing towards the Sea of Azov. Our neighbour on the right intended to advance in the direction of Stepovka. Some units of the 25th Motorised Division, which were still operating in the area, were thus released and sent to Putevel to Kempfev's Corps. Our neighbour on the left occupied Gizdra and was given the task of advancing on Bryansk to act in concert with the 2nd Tank Army. On the night of October 7th, the first snow fell. It quickly melted, but the roads turned into a solid mess and our tanks moved at a snail's pace, and the material part wore out very quickly. We repeatedly asked for delivery of winter uniforms, but we were told that they would be received in time and there was nothing to remind us of it unnecessarily. After that I repeatedly reminded about the need to send winter uniforms, but this year they were never delivered to me. Personnel of the 48th Tank Corps on Von Foot moved along the sinking road to Dmitriev. The Russian counterattacks on Bryansk were repulsed. The 29th Motorized Division reached the mouth of the Revna River. Our neighbor on the right was approaching Shtepovka. Our neighbor on the left sent the 53rd Army Corps to Bryansk from the west. This was to, according to our assumptions, to ease the position of the 47th Tank Corps and to free the road Roslavl Bryansk Oral, necessary for the organization of our supply. The Second Army occupied Sukinichi and Meshchovske. At Vyazma, the 4th and 9th Armies surrounded up to 45 enemy formations. The 10th Panzer Division occupied Vyazma. In the opinion of the General Command of Ground Forces, the created favourable situation favoured the further deployment of operations in the direction of Moscow. German command wanted to prevent the Russians once again to create west of Moscow deeply echeloned line of defence. The general command of land forces carried with the idea that the 2nd Panzer Army advanced through Tula to the boundary of the Oka River between Kolomna and Serpukov. At any rate, it was a very distant goal. In accordance with the same idea, the third tank group was to bypass Moscow from the north. This plan of the commander-in-chief of ground forces met with the full support of the command of Army Group Centre. On October 8th, I flew on the Storch from Sevi SK to Oral, where my vehicles sent there in advance were waiting for me. I flew over the road, which up to Chroma presented a purely gloomy picture. From Chroma to Oral the road had a hard surface, but in this section it was all riddled with craters. General von Geyer reported to me that noted the strengthening of the enemy operating against the 4th Panzer Division, and established the arrival of another infantry division and a tank brigade. The 3rd Armoured Division was moving northward, having as its task to occupy Bolkov. The 4th Armoured Division on October 9th was assigned the task of occupying Mtsensk. Particularly disappointing were the reports we received about the actions of Russian tanks and, most importantly, about their new tactics. Our anti-tank means of that time could successfully act against T-34 tanks 
only under especially favorable conditions. For example, our TIV tank with its short-barreled 75mm gun was able to destroy the T-34 tank only from the rear side, hitting its motor through the louvers. This required great skill. The Russian infantry was advancing from the front, and the tanks were making massive attacks on our flanks. They had already learned something. The severity of the fighting was gradually exerting its influence on our officers and soldiers. General von Geyer again asked me to speed up the delivery of winter uniforms. There was a shortage, above all, of boots, underwear and socks. The seriousness of this message made me think. Therefore, I decided to immediately go to the 4th Tank Division and personally familiarize myself with the state of affairs. On the battlefield, the division commander showed me the results of the battles of October 6th and 7, in which his battle group performed responsible tasks. Tanks hit on both sides were still in their places. The Russian losses were much less than our losses. Returning to Oral, I met Colonel Eberbach there, who also reported to me on the progress of the recent fighting I then met again with General von Geyer and Baron von Langemann, commander of the 4th Panzer Division. For the first time since the beginning of this intense campaign, Eberbach had a tired look, and it was felt that it was not physical fatigue, but mental shock. It was disconcerting that the recent fighting had taken its toll on our best officers. But in the general command of land forces and in the headquarters of the army group reigned in high spirits. It was in this that the gulf between the views of the high command and ours became apparent, although at that time the second tank army knew nothing about the fact that the high command was so intoxicated by our victories. In the evening received a report from the 35th Corps that the enemy is exerting strong pressure on our troops located north of Suzemka. From this we could conclude that surrounded south of Bryansk Russian troops are trying to break through to the east. I contacted the 1st Cavalry Division, which was still on the west bank of the river Sudost, and demanded to inform me if any changes in the behaviour of the enemy. Although nothing suspicious had been noted, I still ordered the division to take the offensive and cross to the east bank of the river. In doing so, the division was to ascertain whether the enemy was still there or had already withdrawn. Soon the 1st Cavalry Division captured a bridgehead here. In the evening from the headquarters of the army group, reported by telephone that the 35th Corps is transferred to the subordination of the 2nd Army and we are removed from responsibility for providing the left flank. I objected, trying to prove that the leadership of all the forces that were blocking the Trubchevsko cauldron can only be successfully conducted by a single headquarters. In addition, we were relieved of responsibility also for the provision of the right flank, as the 34th Corps was transferred to the subordination of the 6th Army, which was to take Kursk with the forces of this corps. This proposal came apparently from the general command of the army or the supreme command of the armed forces and could not be implemented at the present time, because in this case the provision of our right flank was jeopardized. Although Dmitriev was occupied that day, but the poor condition of the roads did not give the opportunity to pull up the rear units of the 48th Panzer Corps and contributed to the prolongation of the critical situation. On October 9th, the Russians continued their attempts to break through in the area of Suzemka. The Russians rapidly attacked the right flank of the 293rd Infantry Division, pushing the division back to Suzemka and Shilinka. Because the 25th Motorized Division, assigned to the reserve of the tank army, had not yet arrived, had to use the 41st Infantry Regiment of the 10th Motorized Division to fill the gap between the 29th Motorized Division and the 293rd Infantry Division, the 48th Tank Corps, which in accordance with the instructions of the Command of Army Group Centre was to advance to Kursk and Livni, was now ordered to pull up to Sevisk all available forces. By 12 o'clock. By 12 noon, the commander of the 25th Motorized Division, General Glesner, arrived in Sevisk and took command of all units operating between the 29th Motorized Division and the 293rd Infantry Division. While fierce fighting was going on in this section, the main forces of the 1st Cavalry Division, without encountering serious resistance, crossed the Sudost River and moved on Trubshevsky. 
The division was misled by the enemy and was now trying to make up for lost time. During the following days, the enemy continued to exert pressure mainly in the directions of Trubshevsk, Sevysk, Trubshevsk, Oral and Trubshevsk, Karachov, but only small groups of Russians managed to break through the road Seredina Budasevsky, including, unfortunately, the headquarters of the 13th Russian Army. In a severe blizzard, the headquarters of the tank army moved to Dmitrovsk. The condition of the roads increasingly deteriorated. Many vehicles were stuck on the so-called highway. Despite all this, our troops seized the Volkov. The 18th Panzer Division, in cooperation with the 2nd Army, surrounded the Russian troops operating north of Bryansk. Simultaneously with all these events, the southern flank of the Eastern Front was preparing for an offensive on Taganrog and Rostov. The advanced units of our neighboring 6th Army were approaching Aktika and Sumy. To our left, our troops crossed the Ugra River on the Moscow direction and occupied Gigersk. On October 10th, new instructions were received from the Army Group Command to seize Kursk to clear the boiler near Trubshevsky to complete the encirclement of the cauldron formed northeast of Bryansk to strike at Tula. All this was proposed to fulfill immediately. Liebenstein did exactly right, asking the command of the army group about the degree of urgency of all these requirements, which clearly came from the high command. However, we received no reply. The following weeks passed in conditions of heavy thaw. Wheeled vehicles could only be moved by tracked vehicles. This caused a great overloading of the tracked vehicles, which was not foreseen in their design, and as a result the vehicles wore out quickly. Due to the lack of ropes and other means necessary for coupling the machines, airplanes had to drop bundles of ropes for the machines stuck on the road. Hundreds of stranded vehicles and their personnel had to be supplied by airplanes for many weeks. Preparation for winter was in a deplorable state. Glycentine, which we had requested eight weeks ago, was supplied in insignificant quantities, as well as winter uniforms for the personnel. The latter circumstance was the cause of great hardship and privation during the following difficult months, which could easily have been eliminated. The enemy continued his attempts to break through in the area of the 29th Motorized Division and the 293rd Infantry Division, the 4th Armored Division managed to break through to Emtsensk. The 6th Army, operating to our right, occupied Sumy. The 13th Army Corps, acting to the left, crossed the Ugra River west of Kaluga. The deterioration of the weather made itself felt and on this section of the front. On October 11th. The Russian troops made an attempt to break out of the Trubshev cauldron, advancing along both banks of the Navia River. The enemy rushed into the gap formed between the 29th and 25th motorized divisions and occupied only by the 5th Machine Gun Battalion. At the same time, in the area of operations of the 24th Panzer Corps, near Mantinsk, northeast of Oral, fierce local fighting broke out, in which the 4th Panzer Division was drawn, but because of the muddle, it could not get sufficient support. A large number of Russian T 34 tanks were thrown into the battle, causing heavy losses to our tanks. The superiority of the material part of our tank forces, hitherto available, was henceforth lost and now passed to the enemy. Thus, the prospects for a quick and continuous success disappeared. I wrote about this new situation for us in my report to the Army Group Command, in which I described in detail the advantage of the T-34 tank over our TIV tank, pointing out the need to change the design of our tanks in the future. I finished my report by proposing to send immediately to our front a commission consisting of representatives of the Armament Directorate the Ministry of Armament, tank designers and representatives of tank building firms. Together with this commission, we were to inspect on the spot the tanks hit on the battlefield and discuss the design of new tanks. I also demanded to speed up the production of larger anti-tank guns capable of penetrating the armor of the T-34 tank. The commission arrived in the second tank army on November 20th. On October 11th, we were informed that the great Germany regiment would, in accordance with Hitler's order, be sent to reinforce the 18th Panzer Division operating northeast of Bryansk on the Karachev, 
Kovastovici Road section. I was further informed that a regrouping of forces was under consideration, according to which the 2nd Army would operate to our right and the 34th and 35th Corps would be transferred to its subordination, while some units of the 2nd Army would be transferred to our subordination. From this we could conclude that the advance to the northeast will continue. Fighting to narrow the encirclement ring around the cauldron continued. On the southern flank of the Eastern Front battles in the area of the Sea of Azov ended with the victory of German troops. The High Command believed that in these battles were destroyed the 6th, 12th and 18th Russian armies, and believed that the necessary prerequisites were created to continue the offensive in the direction of the lower reaches of the Don. SS Division Adolf Hitler was 20 kilometers northwest of Taganrog. Much slower was the offensive of the 17th Army south of Kharkov and the 6th Army in the Sini area. In these areas, fresh Russian forces, supported by tanks, forced the German troops to move in some points to the defence. This circumstance had a negative effect on the position of my right flank. Since the 11th Army was turned south to capture the Crimea, the offensive of Army Group South took a fan-shaped form. North of Army Group Center, the German advance was slowed by snow blizzards. The 3rd Panzer Group reached the upper Volga River at Pogorielo. The snowfall continued also on October 12th. We were still sitting in the small village of Dimitrovsky, the streets of which were a mass of mud, and waited for new instructions from the general command of the land forces regarding the upcoming regrouping. Our troops had closed the ring of encirclement around a large cauldron south of Bryansk and around a small cauldron north of that city, but the troops could not move forward because of the poor condition of the roads, the 48th Tank Corps, which at the beginning of the offensive had advanced so quickly through Sumy and came to a good highway, was now also moving with great difficulty in the direction of Fateh. Near Mintsensk fighting continued with fresh enemy forces. The infantry divisions of the 35th Corps were told to clear the forests in the area of the Trubshevsko cauldron from the enemy. Not only us, but the entire army group south, with the exception of the 1st Tank Army, stuck in the mud, the 6th Army managed to occupy Bogokov northwest of Kharkov. North of us the 13th Army Corps took possession of Kaluga, the 3rd Tank Group took Staritsa, and was advancing on Kalinin. The General Command of Land Forces gave instructions to encircle Moscow, but these instructions did not reach us. On October 13th, the Russians continued their attempts to break through between Navlai and Borshchevo. To reinforce the 47th Panzer Corps, had to send some parts of the 3rd Panzer Division and the 10th Motorized Division of the 24th Panzer Corps. Despite this assistance, and due to the loss of mobility of our units, a group of Russians numbering up to 5,000 men managed to break through and reach the area of Dmitrovsk, where it was again delayed. The troops of the 3rd Tank Group broke into Kalinin, the 9th Army reached the western outskirts of Raziev. On October 14th, we moved our headquarters to Oral and conveniently located in the city council building. During the next few days, both sides showed little activity. The 24th Tank Corp, which had received the task of crossing the Zusha River, managed with great difficulty to pull up its 3rd and 4th Tank Divisions along the swampy roads in the area northwest of Emtents. The 47th Panzer Corps, having finished fighting in the cauldron area, concentrated and cleaned itself up along the oral Karakovev Bryansk Road. The Great Germania Regiment was placed under the command of the 24th Tank Corp and pulled up to Memtsensk. The 48th Panzer Corps, together with parts of the 18th Panzer Division, which had left the town of Kromi on a good highway, occupied Fatish and was preparing for an offensive on Kursk from the northwest at the same time the 34th Corps was to advance on Kursk from the west. With the task of destroying the strong grouping of Russian troops under General Efremov operating in the area, and thus eliminate the constant threat to our right flank. Despite the stubborn Russian defense, the troops of the 6th Army managed to seize Akhtyrka. On the rest of the front, the troops of Army Group South were stuck because of the thaw. 
The state of the weather also negatively affected the pace of advance of Army Group Center. The 57th Army Corps took the town of Borovsky TKM from Moscow. On October 15th, the troops of the 6th Army occupied Krasnopoli, southeast of Sumy. On October 16th, I visited the 4th Armored Division to check the progress of preparations for the offensive from the area of Ntsensk. On that day, the Romanians occupied Odessa. The 46th Tank Corp was approaching Moshaisk. On October 17th, capitulated the group of the enemy, which was encircled north of Bryansk. Together with the 2nd Army, we captured over 50,000 prisoners and up to 400 guns. The main forces of the 50th Russian Army were destroyed. The enemy made counterattacks in the area of Fatech. On October 18th began the offensive of the 11th Army in the Crimea. After occupation of Taganrog, the 1st Tank Army turned to Stalin, the 6th Army occupied Gravoron. The 19th Panzer Division, operating north of our 2nd Panzer Army, occupied Maloyaroslavets. German troops took possession of Moshisk. On October 19th, the 1st Tank Army began preparations for an offensive on Rostov. Its troops broke through to the city of Stalin. The 17th and 6th Armies achieved success in their offensive on Kharkov and Belgorod. The pursuit of the enemy was hampered by bad weather. The same weather was in the area of action of Army Group Center. The 43rd Army Corps occupied Leichfing. For 24 hours this corps operated, being subordinate to the 2nd Tank Army. On October 20th, the group of the enemy encircled in the area of Trubchev's capitulated. The thaw delayed the actions of the entire group of armies. The 1st Tank Army occupied the city of Stalin. The 6th Army was approaching Kharkov by October 21st. It approached the western outskirts of the city. The offensive from the Mtensk area, undertaken on October 22nd by the 24th Tank Corps, failed because of insufficient interaction between tanks and artillery. On October 23rd, the offensive was resumed by the 3rd Tank Division operating northwest of Mtiensk, to which all available tanks were transferred at this time. This time the offensive was successful. On October 24th, in pursuit of the defeated enemy occupied the village of Chern. I personally observed the battles of October 22nd and 23 and got a full idea of the difficult conditions in which our troops had to operate. The reasons for these difficulties were the swampy terrain and extensive minefields of the Russians. On October 23rd, the 18th Armoured Division occupied Fatech. On October 24th, the 6th Army captured Kharkov and Belgorod, completely clearing them of the enemy. To our left, the 43rd Army Corps occupied Belev on the Oka River. On October 25th, I was present at the approach of the Great Germany Regiment to Czerny and observed the fighting that Eberbach's group was conducting in the northern part of the locality. By October 25th, the fighting in the Bryansk area was over. On that day, the previously announced distribution of forces on the right flank of Army Group Center began the 34th and 35th Corps and the 48th Panzer Corps, without the 25th Motorized Division, were transferred to the 2nd Army the 1st. Cavalry Division was sent home to East Prussia to be reformed into the 24th Panzer Division. Instead, the 2nd Armoured Army received the 43rd Army Corps under General Heinrichi, which included the 31st and 131st Infantry Divisions and General Weisenberger's 53rd Army Corps, which included the 112th and 167th Infantry Divisions. After a short time, the 296th Infantry Division was placed under the Army, while the 25th Motorized Division remained under the 2nd Army. The 2nd Tank Army was now tasked to strike at Tula. The 2nd Army in the new composition was sent to the east and thus was again disconnected from us. Having successfully completed the battles in the areas of Bryansk and Vyazma, Army Group Center has thus achieved another major tactical success. The question of whether it is able to continue the offensive to turn this tactical success in the operational was the most important since the beginning of the war, the question facing the high command of the German army.
The second panzer army continued its advance on Tula. The only road on which our troops could move, the highway oral Tula was not suitable for the movement of heavy vehicles and tanks, and in a few days was finally broken. In addition, the Russians, who were masters of destruction, blew up all the bridges during the withdrawal, and in the narrower places mined large areas of terrain along the road. In order to somehow provide transportation for the troops, it was necessary to build several kilometres long decks of logs. The combat effectiveness of the advancing units depended not so much on the number of personnel as on the possibility of providing them with fuel. Therefore, all available tanks of the 24th Tank Corps were united under the command of Colonel Eberbach, and together with the regiment Great Germany formed the vanguard, which was sent to Tula. On October 26th, the 53rd Army Corps reached the Oka River, while the 43rd Army Corps extended a pre-bridge fortification on the Oka River near Belov, occupied by the 31st Infantry Division. Our right neighbour sent its 48th Tank Corps to Kursk. To our left, in the band of the 4th Army, the Russians launched counterattacks that forced the German troops to go on the defensive. October 27th and 28th, I accompanied the offensive Eberbach's group. On October 27th, the Supreme Command of the Armed Forces had the idea that in the event of receiving information about the approach of fresh Russian forces to turn our army from the east to Voronezh. However, there were no highways in that direction. In any case, as a prerequisite for such an operation, we had to first seize Tula. I asked Liebenstein to instill this thought in the command. The night of October 27th to 28th I spent in Cherny, in the abandoned building of the children's hospital, swarming with bedbugs. Our advanced units reached the Plavak area. The 53rd and 43rd Army Corps expanded their pre-bridge fortifications on the Oko River the 4th Army repelled fierce Russian attacks. October 28th, I was informed through Liebenstein that the high command of the armed forces abandoned its intention to turn us to Voronezh. The offensive on Tula continued. In view of the lack of fuel, Eberbach put one battalion of the regiment Great Germany on the tanks. We reached Pissarev, 30 kilometres south of Tula. The reconnaissance of the 43rd Army Corps reached Odivo. I spent the night again in Cherny in order to fly back to my headquarters in the morning on the Storch. On October 28th, we received Hitler's wish to capture by our mobile bile battalions the bridges over the Oka east of Serpukov. We could only throw our units forward as far as it was possible to supply them. On the finally destroyed Oral Tula Road, our vehicles could move at a maximum speed of 20 km hour, and even then, not always. Mobile battalions no longer existed. Hitler lived in a world of illusions. On this day, the 1st Tank Army crossed the Mayas River and the 17th Army across the Donetsk River. October 29th, our main tank units reached a point 4 km from Tula. The attempt to capture the city from the run ran into a strong anti-tank and anti-aircraft defence and ended in failure and we suffered significant losses in tanks and officers. I was visited by the commander of the 43rd Army Corps, General Heinrichsey, always distinguished by his sober judgment, and reported that his troops are poorly supplied, and since October 20th they even stopped receiving bread. By October 30th, the 53rd Army Corps reached the highway Oral Tula. After the end of fighting in the area of the Bryant's Cauldron, on October 19th, Corps Commander General Weisenberger pulled up the 167th Infantry Division through Volkov, Gorbachev, and the 112th Infantry Division through Belev, Arsenyevo, Tarevo. Because of the thaw, the Corps was unable to take with it all motorized vehicles, and in particular heavy artillery. Motorized units of the Corps had to make a detour through Oral, Mtensk information about the approach of the Russians from the east, received since October 27th, forced me to move the 53rd Army Corps to the section Epiphan, Stalinogorsk, in order to ensure the right flank. The condition of the highway Oral Tula by this time became so bad that the 3rd Panzer Division, which approached Tula after Eberbach's group, had to be supplied by air.
Due to the impossibility of taking Tula from the front, General Baron von Geyer proposed to bypass the city from the east. I agreed with this proposal and ordered him to advance in the direction of Didilovo and capture the crossing on the Shat River. General Gaia considered it absolutely impossible to use motorized troops before the onset of frost and was certainly right. It was possible to move forward only very slowly and at the cost of heavy losses in material. In connection with this situation, the restoration of the railroad section in Tensk Tula was of great importance. Despite all efforts, the restoration work was very slow. Lack of locomotives forced me to look for a way out of the situation, and I asked for the sending of road trains, however, we did not receive a single one. On November 1st, the 24th Tank Corps reached the area west of Didilovo. When the vanguard of the 53rd Army Corps approached the village of Teploj on November 2nd, it suddenly encountered the enemy. It was a large Russian grouping consisting of two cavalry divisions, five infantry divisions and one tank brigade, advancing along the highway of Freemove Tula and, apparently, had the task of attacking the rear and flank of the 24th Tank Corps in the vicinity of Tula. The appearance of units of the 53rd Army Corps was apparently as much of a surprise to the Russians as their appearance to the Germans. From November 3rd to November 3rd to November 13th, fighting broke out in the Teplo area, as a result of which the 53rd Army Corps, supported by Eberbach's tank brigade, managed to push the enemy back to Efremov, capturing more than 3,000 prisoners and a considerable number of guns. The frosts that came on the night of November 3rd to 4th, although facilitated movement, but cases of frostbite caused great damage to the troops. To provide a stretched flank in the area of Amtinsk, Chern and to the east were east were used infantry and other non-tank units of the 17th Armoured Division, which by this time came up here from the area of Karachev. The Oral, Tula Highway was being repaired continuously by sapper and construction battalions, as well as units of the workers' battalions of the state labour conscription. In these days the 48th Tank Corp is occupied Kursk. On November 5th, I was briefly visited by Field Marshal von Bock. Army Group Command on November 4th came to the conclusion that the Russians systematically cleared the area west of the Don between Voronezh and Stalinogorsk and reported this opinion to the General Command of Ground Forces. However, the situation in the field of action of the 2nd Tank Army refuted this opinion. On the contrary, in the area of Teplo the enemy was advancing. On November 6th, I flew to the front. My impressions from this trip can be seen from the following letter. Our troops are in anguish, and our cause is in a poor state for the enemy is gaining time, and we with our plans are facing the inevitability of fighting in winter conditions. My mood is therefore very sad. The best wishes are failing because of the elements. The one-of-a-kind opportunity to strike the enemy with a powerful blow is slipping away faster and faster, and I am not sure it can ever return. God alone knows how the situation will turn out in the future. One must have hope and not lose courage, but it is a difficult ordeal. Hopefully I will be able to write in a more cheerful tone in the near future. I am not worried about myself. However, it is difficult to be in good spirits at present. On November 7th, the frost first inflicted heavy losses on us. It was reported that the first tank army, which was advancing on Rostov, on November 5th came to the dawn. November 8th, the 53rd Army Corps achieved success in the area of Teploy 24th Tank Corps, repelled enemy attacks from Tula. On November 9th, the enemy's intentions to launch counterattacks east and west of Tula became clear. Therefore, the 24th Tank Corps, having transferred Eberbach's tank brigade to the 53rd Army Corps, moved to the defence. The 17th Tank Division without its tanks was subordinated to the 24th Tank Corps and pulled up to the locality of Plavske. In view of the fact that east of Cherny new enemy units were noted, the flank support in the section Mbsensk, Cherny was transferred to other units of the 47th Tank Corps. How tense was these days the situation in the area of Tula?
can be judged at least by the fact that four weak battalions of the 4th Panzer Division occupied a front width of 35 kilometers in order to provide communication between the 53rd Army Corps and the 3rd Panzer Division operating near Tula. On November 12th, the temperature dropped to 13 degrees of frost, on November 13th to 22 degrees. On this day in Orsha, under the leadership of the Chief of General Staff of the Land Forces, a meeting of the commanders of the Armies of Armies of Army Group Center was held and announced the order for the fall offensive of 1941. This order put before the 2nd Panzer Army the task to seize the city of Gorky, which was 600 kilometers from Oral. Liebenstein immediately stated that the 2nd Panzer Army in the present situation is only able to reach Veneva. Now it's not May and we are not in France. I fully shared the opinion of my chief of staff and immediately reported in writing to the commander of the army group that the tank army is not able to fulfill this order. In making my report, I drew on fresh impressions from a trip to the front on November 13th and 14, during which I visited the 53rd Army Corps and the 24th Tank Corps. On November 13th, I flew a storch from Oral, but north of Cerny got caught in a snowstorm and was forced to make a landing at a temporary airfield in Cerny. From there, in 22 degree frost, I went by car to Plavok to General Weisenberger. It was the last day of fighting in the Teplo area, and Weisenberger reported to me the situation. He was tasked to advance in the direction of Volovo, Stalinogorsk, to ensure the right flank against the Russian troops retreating to Efremu Vebabakank Brigade was left in his command until the 18th Panzer Division approached. Combat infantry reduced to an average of 50 men in each company. The lack of winter uniforms became more and more noticeable. The actions of the 24th Tank Corps were greatly hindered by ice, because in the absence of special spikes for tracks, tanks could not overcome the icy slopes. General Baron von Geyer believed that the corps was not able to go on the offensive before November 19th. For this he needed Eberbach's tank brigade and a fuel reserve for four days he only had fuel reserves for one day. In my opinion, he should have scheduled the offensive for November 17th in order to cooperate with the 53rd Army Corps to prevent the enemy from forming a new front on the line Volovo, Didilovo. In addition, the 43rd Army Corps was attacked west of Tula and needed support, the 47th Tank Corps, consisting of the 18th Tank, 10th Infantry and 29th Motorized Divisions, was to provide our right flank. I spent the night in Plavsky. On November 14th in the morning I visited the 167th Infantry Division and talked to many officers and soldiers. The supply of troops was poor. There was a shortage of white camouflage coats, boot ointment, underwear, and above all cloth pants. A significant part of the soldiers were dressed in pants made of cotton fabric, and this in 22 degree frost. There was also an urgent need for boots and stockings. In the afternoon I visited the 112th Infantry Division, where I saw the same picture. Our soldiers, dressed in Russian overcoats and fur hats, could be recognized only by their emblems. All the stocks of uniforms available in the tank army were immediately sent to the front. However, compared to the needs, this was only a drop in the ocean. In the heroic Eberbach Brigade there were no more than 50 tanks left. In the three tank divisions there were about 600 tanks. Holo ice greatly hindered the action of the tanks, especially since the spikes had not yet been received. Because of the frost, the glasses of optical devices were sweating, and a special ointment to counteract this had not yet been received. Before starting the tank engines had to be heated. The fuel partially froze, the oil thickened. There was also a shortage of winter uniforms and glycentine. The 43rd Army Corps reported bloody fighting. I spent the night again in Plavsky. On November 15th the Russians continued their attacks on the positions of the 43rd Army Corps. November 16th General Heinrichsy came to see me losses from frost lack of uniforms lice. On November 17th we received information about the unloading of the Siberians at Uzlovaya station, as well as about the unloading of other units on the Ryazan-Kolomna section. 
the 112th Infantry Division ran into fresh Siberian units. In view of the fact that the division was simultaneously attacked by Russian tanks from the direction of Didilovo, its weakened units were not able to withstand this onslaught. Assessing their actions, we must take into account that each regiment had already lost by this time at least 400 men with frostbite. Automatic weapons were ineffective because of the cold, and our 37mm anti-tank guns were powerless against Russian T-34 tanks. It came to panic, which covered the section of the front up to Bogoroditsk. This panic, which occurred for the first time since the beginning of the Russian campaign, was a serious warning indicating that our infantry has exhausted its fighting ability and is no longer capable of major efforts. The situation on the front of the 112th Infantry Division was remedied by the 53rd Army Corps' own efforts, which turned the 167th Infantry Division on Uslovaya. Our badly stretched flank was meanwhile supplied by the approaching units of the 47th Panzer Corps. We are approaching our final objective very slowly in icy cold and under exceptionally poor conditions for the accommodation of our unfortunate soldiers. Every day the difficulties of supply by railroad are increasing. It is the difficulties of supply that are the chief cause of all our calamities, for without fuel our vehicles cannot move. Were it not for these difficulties we would be much nearer our goal. And yet our brave troops have won one victory after another, overcoming with amazing patience all difficulties. We should be grateful that our men are such good soldiers. As combat operations continued through the winter, we had to take care to supply food to the German population, the army, as well as to the Russian civilian population. As a result of the rich harvest in the fall of 1941, there was plenty of bread left in the fields. There was no shortage of slaughtered livestock either. The second tank army could not be required to send large quantities of foodstuffs to Germany, given the poor state of railroad transportation. After the needs of the troops had been met, the entire Russian population living in the cities, especially the population of Oral, was given food for the period up to March 31, 1942. In order that the population should not be disturbed in this respect, we posted notices all over Oral about the measures taken to provide the population with food. The Russian government had colossal grain elevators in the fertile Black Earth regions where large stocks of grain were stored. To supply the needs of our army, as well as to give the population work and bread, we put into operation several factories and plants, the equipment of which the Russians had not had time to evacuate from Oral. Among the enterprises we started up were a tinware factory, a tannery and a felt shop of a shoe factory. About the mood prevailing among the Russian population it was possible. By the way, to judge by the statements of one old Taris general, with whom I had to talk in those days in the horde, he said if you had come twenty years ago we would have met you with great enthusiasm. Now it is too late, we are just now beginning to come to life again and you came and set us back twenty years so we have to start all over again. Now we are fighting for Russia and in this we are all united. On November 18th, the second tank army went on the offensive in accordance with the order received on November 13th in Orsha. Participating in the offensive were 47th Tank Corp. Impokor Fuplers. The 18th Armoured Division was advancing on the factory town of Ifrimov on November 20th. After persistent street fighting, the division captured this town and held it despite fierce enemy counterattacks. The 10th Motorized Division was advancing on Epifan. Mikhailov, the 29th Motorized Division, was advancing on Spaskoye, Gremiechi, having the task to provide the eastern flank of the army from a possible attack of fresh enemy forces from the area of Ravryazan, Kolomna. The 25th Motorized Division by that time was still engaged in one of the operations of the Supreme Command of the Armed Forces to destroy the encircled enemy, and after the fulfillment of its task was to make up the Corps' reserve. 53rd Army Corps, Urub. The 167th Infantry Division was advancing through Stalinogorsk toward Veniv. 112th Infantry Division was advancing to Stalinogorsk where it was supposed to create a pre-bridge fortification on the Don River later, taking into account the losses of this division, it was supposed to be replaced by the 56th Infantry Division, 
which was part of the reserve of the army group and was to come from the Karachev area. The 24th Armoured Corps was tasked with the 17th, 3rd and 4th Armoured Divisions, the Great Germany. Regiment and the 296th Infantry Division advancing from the south to cover the city of Tula from both sides and seize it ahead of the 24th Armoured Corps and the 53rd Army Corps, a battle group of the 17th Armoured Division, was advancing to Kashira. With the task of seizing the bridge across the Oka River, and preventing the approach of enemy reinforcements from the Moscow area. The 43rd Army Corps with the 31st and 131st Infantry Divisions was advancing through Lykfin and Kaluga to the area between the rivers of Pah and Oka, having the task to clear it of the enemy and to provide the connection between the 2nd Tank Army and the 4th Army in the area of Tula, Alexin. The 2nd Army, our neighbour on the right flank, was tasked to advance in the direction east of Oral. We could not count on support from its side. It was known that to the west of the road Elitz, if removed Russians are making trench work, and the command of the Second Army concluded that the assumptions about the withdrawal of the Russians behind the Don were not justified. The Fourth Army, acting to the left of the Second Tank Army, had the task of forcing the Oka north of Alexin and attacking Sir Pukov, the army had up to 36 divisions. The second tank army had only won 2.5 badly battered divisions. Infantry units still had not received winter uniforms and could hardly move. In a day they travelled 5, at most 10 kilometres. The army's ability to cope with the tasks delivered to it was more than doubtful. On November 18th, with strong air support, the 47th Tank Corps managed to capture Epiphan and the 24th Tank Corps Didilovo. On November 19th, the 24th Tank Corps reached Bolokovo. November 21, the 53rd Army Corps took Uslovaya on November 24th, the 24th Tank Corps took Veniev and hit 50 Russian tanks, the 43rd Army Corps was slowly advancing to the Upa River. While this advance was taking place, November 21st, in the area of action of the forward units of the 47th Tank Corps, appeared dangerous fresh enemy forces the 50th Army of the Russians, which included the 108th Tank Brigade, 299th Rifle Division, 31st Cavalry Division and other units. The situation again became serious. The 1st Panzer Army of Army Group South, after a long and difficult transition on marshy and icy roads, reached the northern outskirts of Rostov on November 19th and engaged in heavy fighting there. On November 21st, the army took full possession of Rostov. Bridges across the Don were destroyed by the Russians. Anticipating the possibility of enemy counterattacks in the near future, the 1st Tank Army moved to the defence. On November 20th, the 48th Tank Corps of the 2nd Army occupied the town of Tim, and already on November 23rd, it was counterattacked in the area by the enemy. The terrible cold, miserable conditions of cantonment, lack of uniforms, heavy losses in personnel and material, as well as a completely unsatisfactory state of supply of fuel, all this turns the leadership of combat operations in a continuous torment. And I am more and more pressed by the enormous responsibility, which, despite all the beautiful words, no one can remove me. I have spent three days on the front line in order to get the most accurate picture of the situation at the front, and now I intend, if the fighting situation allows me, to go on Sunday to the headquarters of the army group to get information about the prospects for the near future, about which we do not know anything yet. What the command is thinking about, I do not know, just as I do not know how we will be able to clean up by spring. November 23rd in the afternoon I decided to personally go to the commander of Army Group Centre and ask him to change the task assigned to me, which has become impossible. I reported to Field Marshal von Bock that the 2nd Tank Army was in a very difficult situation and that its troops, especially infantry units, are extremely fatigued. I pointed out the lack of winter clothing, the poor performance of the rear service, the small number of tanks and guns, as well as the threat to the strongly stretched eastern flank from fresh enemy forces arriving from the far east in the area of Ryazan, Kolomna. 
Field Marshal von Bock replied to me that the texts of my previous reports he had already sent to the General Command of the Land Forces, and it is well aware of the true situation at the front. Then von Bock ordered to connect him by telephone with the Commander-in-Chief of the Army and suggested that I put on headphones and listen to his conversation with the Commander-in-Chief. After outlining the content of my report on the situation, von Bock asked the Commander-in-Chief to change the task assigned to me, cancel the order to attack, and give the order to move to the defence in convenient in winter conditions positions. The Commander-in-Chief of the Ground Forces, in all likelihood, was not free to make a decision. In his answers he tried to avoid the most difficult questions. Rejecting my suggestions, he ordered us to continue the offensive. After our urgent demands to indicate to us at least some attainable and not too distant goal, having reached which we could then create a defensive line, the Commander-in-Chief finally named to us the line of Mikhailov, Zaraisk and added that our most important task was the complete destruction of the railway line Ryazan Kolomna. I was not satisfied with the results of my trip to the headquarters of the army group. On the same day I sent to report to the Chief of General Staff, who was on my staff liaison officer of the General Command of the Army Lieutenant Colonel von Kolden. He was also to try to obtain an order to suspend the offensive, but he returned without achieving any results negative attitude of the Commander-in-Chief of the Army and the Chief of the General Staff to my proposals allowed to conclude that they themselves, and not just one Hitler, are in favour of continuing the offensive. In any case, the highest military command was now aware of the extremely difficult situation of my army, and I believe that Hitler was also reported in detail. November 24th, 10th Motorised Division occupied Mikhailov, 29th Motorized Division advanced 40 km north of the town of Epiphan. On November 25th, the battle group of the 17th Panzer Division approached Kashira. Our neighbor on the right occupied Livni. On November 26th, the 53rd Army Corps approached the Don, forced it with the 167th Infantry Division near Ivanozoro, and attacked the Siberians northeast of this settlement near Donskia. The Valiant Division captured 42 guns, some vehicles and up to 4,000 prisoners. From the east, the 29th Motorized Division of the 47th Tank Corps was advancing on the Siberians, as a result of which the enemy was surrounded. I was in the 53rd Army Corps that day and decided to go on November 27th to the headquarters of the 47th Tank Corps and the 29th Motorized Division. In the morning I arrived at Epiphan, where General Lemelson reported to me that during the night the 29th Motorized Division found itself in a critical position. The main forces of the 239th Siberian Rifle Division, leaving their artillery and vehicles, broke out of encirclement and went east. Stretched encirclement line of parts of the 29th Motorized Division could not contain the Russian breakthrough and suffered heavy losses. I went to Division Headquarters and to the 71st Infantry Regiment, which had suffered the most. At first I thought that the cause of the mishap was the poor state of reconnaissance and guarding. However, after hearing the reports of the battalion commander and company commanders on the spot, it became clear to me that the troops were faithfully doing their duty and that the cause of the breakthrough was the superiority of the enemy's forces. The authenticity of the reports I received was evidenced by the numerous corpses of German soldiers who lay on the battlefield in full uniform and with weapons in their hands. I tried to encourage the personnel of the regiment and make them forget their failure. The Siberians had slipped away from us, though without their heavy weapons and vehicles, and we had no strength to hold them off. This was the saddest event of the day. The pursuit of the enemy who had slipped away immediately undertaken by the motorcycle units of the 29th Motorized Division, yielded no results. I then went to the Reconnaissance Battalion and the 33rd Motorized Rifle Regiment of the 4th Armored Division, and by nightfall went to the headquarters of the 24th Tank Corps. Only he who in this winter of our misfortune had personally seen the endless expanse of the Russian snowy plains, where the icy wind instantly covered all traces, only he who had travelled for hours through the no-man's land 
meeting only in significant guarding units, whose soldiers did not have the necessary uniforms and food, while fresh Siberian enemy units were dressed in excellent winter uniforms and received good food, only he could correctly assess the serious events that soon followed. Colonel Bork, at that time the referent of the General Command of the Army for Armoured Forces, accompanied me on this trip. I asked him to convey to the Commander-in-Chief of the Army my impressions of the trip. Our most urgent task was to seize Tula. It was unthinkable to conduct further operations to the north or east, i.e. in the direction of our immediate objectives, without first mastering this important hub of communications and airfield. My visit to the Corps' commanders was to prepare an offensive on Tula, the difficulties of which I clearly imagined. We wanted to capture the city by a double attack the 24th Panzer Corps from the north and east, and the 43rd Army Corps from the west. During this operation the 53rd Army Corps was to provide our northern flank against the enemy forces operating from the Moscow direction, and the 47th Tank Corps the stretched eastern flank against the Siberians being transferred here. The 10th Motorized Division of this corps, having reached the town of Mikhailov on November 27, in accordance with the order, sent groups of bombers to blow up the railroad on the ryazan columna section. But unfortunately, these groups could not fulfill their task. The Russian defences were too strong. Because of the cold weather during the advance on Efremov, almost all the artillery of the 18th Panzer Division was out of action. On November 29th, superior enemy forces for the first time exerted strong pressure on the 10th Motorized Division. Therefore, our troops were forced to leave Skopin. The offensive strength of the 24th Tank Corps which had been fighting continuously for several months, was also greatly reduced. Corps artillery had only 11 guns. In the southern part of the Eastern Front, on November 27, superior Russian forces launched an offensive on Rostov. The situation there became extremely tense. To our right was noted the strengthening of the enemy acting against the Second Army. On the left flank of my army, the 43rd Army Corps reached the highway Tula G. Alexin. Here the Corps encountered large enemy forces, which immediately launched counterattacks. The 2nd Tank Division of the 4th Army reached Krasnaya Polyana, 22 kilometers northwest of Moscow. On November 28th, the Russians again broke through to Rostov. The 1st Tank Army had to prepare for the abandonment of the city. Our successes in the field of action of the 43rd Army Corps remained insignificant. On this day, the Army Group Command refused to attack the far-flung objectives that were specified by the Army Main Command, ordering first of all to make our way to Tula. On November 30th, the General Command of the Army expressed doubt as to whether we had concentrated enough forces to conduct an offensive on Tula. Strengthening the group advancing on Tula was possible only by reducing the forces of the 47th Tank Corp, intended to support our flank. Given the growing threat from the east, I considered it risky. However, on the same day on the southernmost section of the German Eastern Front occurred an event that most vividly illuminated our overall situation. On this day, Army Group South left Rostov. The next day, the commander of this group, Field Marshal von Rundstedt, was removed from his post and replaced by Field Marshal von Reichenau. This was the first alarming signal. Nevertheless, neither Hitler, nor the Supreme Command of the Armed Forces, nor the General Command of the Land Forces paid any attention to it. Our total losses on the Eastern Front, starting on June 22, 1941, reached already 743,000 people, which was 23% of the total strength of our armed forces, which numbered about 3.5 million people. On the same day, November 30th, the strengthening of the enemy operating against my northern flank near Kashira was noted. It was obvious that the enemy was transferring from the central section of the front, west of Moscow, part of his forces to the threatened flanks. I received word of the death of my combat comrade in arms from the summer of this year, Colonel Melder, and was extremely saddened that we had lost one of our best soldiers. The intensification of guerrilla warfare in the Balkans required the German command to send more and more troops there. 
The new commander of the army group Field Marshal von Reichenau recognized the inevitable surrender of Rostov and withdrawal of the 1st Panzer Army behind the line of the Myers River. Thus, the removal of Rundstedt from the post of commander in 24 hours was completely unnecessary action. Meanwhile, my army continued to prepare for the offensive, which we expected to begin on December 2nd in cooperation with the 4th Army. However, on December 1st, we were informed that the 4th Army will go on the offensive only on December 4th. I would have willingly postponed the beginning of the offensive and for my army in order to act simultaneously with the 4th Army, as well as to wait for the approach of the 296th Infantry Division. However, the 24th Tank Corps Corp on the initial positions of which the enemy was exerting strong pressure, could not wait any longer, and I decided to start the offensive on December 2nd by the forces of this corp. We organised our forward command post in Yasnia Poliana, the former estate of Count Tolstoy. I visited the command post on December 2nd. Yasnia Poliana was behind the command post of the Great Germania Regiment, seven kilometres south of Tula. I also asked Bolk to report my assessment of the situation to the Commander-in-Chief of the Land Forces, but I do not know whether he was able to fulfil my request. Yesterday I was visited by Richthofen. He and I had a long conversation face to face and established that we have the same view of the situation. Finally I had a conversation with General Schmidt, who commanded the army operating on our right. He also agreed with me in everything. In any case, I am not alone in my views, although alas it does not matter, because no one was interested in them. I myself could not believe that within two months it would be possible to worsen so much the situation, which was almost brilliant. If a timely decision was taken to stop the offensive and the transition for the winter period to the defence at a favourable and pre-equipped line, nothing dangerous would not have happened. Now for many months came complete uncertainty. I least of all think of myself, much more interested in the fate of the whole of Germany, for which I am very afraid. December 9th, the enemy developing success in the area of Livni, where the 2nd German Army surrounded parts of the 95th Infantry Division. In the field of action of my army, the 47th Tank Corp was retreating to the southwest. 24th Panzer Corp repulsed Russian attacks from Tula. December 10th, I reported in writing about our situation Hitler's chief adjutant Schmunt and the head of the personnel department of the general staff of the ground forces command Keitel J.R. So that they there are no further illusions. On the same day I wrote to my wife it is to be hoped that these letters of mine will reach their addressee in time, for with the establishment of complete clarity and with a firm will the situation can still be corrected. We underestimated the enemy's forces the size of his territory and the severity of the climate, and for this we must now pay the price. It is still good that on December 5th I independently decided to stop the offensive, for otherwise the catastrophe would have been imminent. December 10th was marked by the unloading of Russian troops in the area of Kastonaya and Eletz. In the band of action of the Second Army, the enemy widened the breakthrough and cut the road livni Chernova. The 10th Motorized Division of my army fought defensive battles in Epiphany. The 53rd Army Corps and the 24th Tank Corps reached the boundary of the Don, Shat, Upa Rivers. Between the 296th and 31st Infantry Divisions formed a dangerous gap. On December 11th, the corps of our neighbour to the right continued to withdraw westward. Ephraimov was threatened, and on December 12th it was surrendered. In order to close the gap created in the front of the 43rd Army Corps, the 4th Army was ordered to send there the 137th Infantry Division. However, it took some time for the division to be able to approach this area due to the considerable distance and bad weather. Therefore, during December 12th, we were forced to send all our available mobile forces to help our neighbour to the right who was in trouble. On December 13th, the Second Army continued its withdrawal. Under these circumstances, the Second Tank Army was not able to hold on the line Stalinogorsk, R. Shat R. Upa, especially since the 112th Tank Army. 
UPA, especially since the 112th Infantry Division, did not have enough forces to provide further resistance and delay the advance of fresh enemy forces. The troops were forced to withdraw behind the line of the River Plava. The 4th Army acting to our left and above all the 4th and 3rd tank groups could not hold their positions either. On December 14th, I arrived in Roslavl, where I met with the Commander-in-Chief of the Ground Forces Field Marshal von Brochich. Field Marshal von Kluge was also present. In order to get to Roslavl, I had to travel for 22 hours by automobile in a snow blizzard. I described in detail to the Commander-in-Chief of the Land Forces the situation of my troops, and asked him to allow my army to withdraw to the frontier of the Zusha and Oka rivers, where during the October battles there was our advanced line, which was equipped to some extent. The commander-in-chief gave me his consent to this. The question was also raised as to how to close the 40-kilometre gap formed between the 24th Tank Corp and the 43rd Army Corps. For this purpose, the 4th Army was to transfer to the subordination of the 2nd Panzer Army 137th Infantry Division. However, Field Marshal von Kluge had so far sent only four battalions of this division under the command of the division commander. I considered this totally insufficient and requested that the remaining half of the division would also be immediately sent to my disposal. During the fighting of this division for the closing of the gap, the brave General Bergman was killed. The resulting dangerous gap between the corps was never closed. As a result of the meeting in Roslavl, the following order followed the Second Army is subordinated to the commander of the Second Tank Army. Both armies must hold the frontier in front of Kursk, Oral, Plavsky, Alexin, and in extreme case along the Oke River. I was convinced that the commander-in-chief will report to Hitler about this order, but further events shook this confidence. On this day, a deep breakthrough undertaken by the Russians on December 13th through Livni in the direction of Oral had its effect was surrounded and partially destroyed 45th Infantry Division. The bare ice made all kinds of movement difficult. Losses from frostbite were greater than from enemy fire. I had to withdraw the 47th Tank Corps as its neighbour on the right, the 293rd Infantry Division of the 2nd Army, retreated from Ephraimov. On December 16th, at my urgent request, Schmunto was nearby, arrived at the airfield in Oral, with whom I had a half-hour conversation. I outlined to him the seriousness of the situation and asked him to report it to the Führer. I hoped that during the night Hitler would call me to the telephone to give me an answer to my proposals, which I conveyed with Schmunt. During the conversation I learned of an impending change in the general command of the land forces the change of Field Marshal von Brockich. That same night I wrote I spent the night without sleep, puzzling over what else I could do to help my soldiers, who remained completely helpless in the conditions of this crazy winter. It is hard to even imagine their terrible situation. The workers of the high command, who have never been to the front, are unable to imagine the true situation of the troops. They are always telegraphing only impossible orders and refuse to meet all our requests and fulfill our proposals. That same night Hitler called me on the phone, demanded to hold firm and, forbidding us to withdraw, promised to airlift replenishment, if I'm not mistaken, 500 people. Hitler's telephone calls were then repeated many times, but the audibility was very poor. As for the withdrawal, it had already begun to be carried out in accordance with the conversation in Roslavl with Field Marshal von Brokic, and it was quite impossible to stop it. On December 17th, I visited the commanders of the 24th and 47th Panzer Corps, as well as the commander of the 53rd Army Corps, in order to once again familiarise myself with the situation of the troops and to talk to the corps commanders about the situation. All three generals believed that our available forces were insufficient to organise a staunch defence of the Eastern OK. Hence, it followed that we need to preserve the combat effectiveness of troops until the approach of fresh forces, when it will be possible to create a solid defence. The generals reported that the troops were beginning to doubt the abilities of the High Command, which had given its last order for an offensive, while estimating the enemy's capabilities quite wrongly. 
Had we possessed our former maneuverability and fighting ability, the execution of this order would have cost nothing. The bare ice made all our movements difficult. The Russians are well equipped and well prepared for winter, and we have nothing. The Second Army feared that the enemy would make a breakthrough that day in the direction of Novosul. Taking into account all the current situation, and with the consent of the command of the army group, decided to fly to the Fuhrer's main headquarters and personally report to him the situation, since all my reports, both written and by telephone, did not lead to any results. The conversation was scheduled for December 20th. By this time, Field Marshal von Bock filed a report of illness, and he was replaced as commander of Army Group Center by Field Marshal von Kluge. On December 18th, the Second Army was ordered to defend the line Tim, Livni, Varkafi, and in a few days, joining the right flank of the Second Panzer Army to withdraw to the line B, Zusha River, Zusha River. The Second Tank Army was ordered to withdraw to the line Mogilki, Verk, Plevi, Sorochenka, Chukina, Kuzmino. The 43rd Army Corp was subordinated to the 4th Army. December 19th, 47th Tank Corp and 53rd Army Corp took up the defence along the Plava River. I decided to withdraw the 47th Tank Corps to the line Ozaki and the 24th Tank Corps to concentrate as a reserve of the army in the area of Oral in order to give it a short rest, and then use it as an operational mobile reserve. The 4th Army was attacked by the enemy on its left flank and in some places thrown back, 